I'd like to start off uh, just asking what has been the total cost of the RET review? Uh, Brad Archer, First Assistant Secretary, uh, RET Review Secretariat. Uh, the figure I have, uh, Senator, for the total cost of the review uh, is $587,000. $329. Uh, that is a figure uh, that, that, that does not include the salaries of the staff on the Secretariat, uh, but does include uh, um, the majority of the other costs uh, of the review. Uh, I guess other exceptions would be some overheads, um, such as IT and accommodation and things like that, that um, were provided by uh, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Okay, could you just run through for me how much um, the members of the um, review team were paid, so Brian Fisher, Dick Warburton, etc.? Yes, I can, Senator. Uh, Mr Warburton received uh, sitting fees um, of in the order of $73,000. Uh, Mr Fisher, um, 39000 $900. Uh, Ms. Intfeld, $43,900. And Mr. Zima, $29,700. Okay, thank you. And can you tell me um, the total amount paid to ASIL Allen for their modelling? Uh, the figure for the, the modelling consultancy, uh, $287,468. Okay. And um, what was the overall budget that was allocated for the RET review? Uh, Senator, we didn't really have um, a sort of a fixed or predetermined budget. Um, no, so the first thing to note is that, um, leaving aside the salaries of the Secretariat staff, uh, it is actually the Department of the Environment uh, which has funded uh, the costs of the review. Um, the uh, department had, had done some planning around the possibility of a review and had, I guess, provisioned for that possibility. Um, but I don't have with me, uh, and I'm not sure we had a, a fixed or predetermined budget uh, to work to, although we had some idea of what, what the review might cost. Okay, but it came out of the Department of the Environment's budget? Uh, correct. There was no additional uh, money provided to the department for the review. Okay. So, uh, in its terms of reference, um, the government requested the review to put forward options that would reduce electricity prices. So, has the department raised with the review panel the fact that they misled the government in answering the terms of reference? Because, in particular, the, the, it said the review should provide advice on the extent of the RET's impact on electricity prices and the range of options available to reduce any impact while managing sovereign risk. And then, of course, what the review recommended was the two most expensive options uh, rather than the cheaper ones. So, did you take that up? Uh, with the review panel that they actually misled the government in terms of their terms of reference? Uh, well, well, the short answer to that, Senator, is no. Um, and, and I don't think uh, it, it occurred to the government that it had been misled. Well, given that they were asked to put forward the options to reduce any impact um, while managing sovereign risk, the two options that would drive down prices were actually ignored and they were the options in figure ES5 of the ASIL modelling report. So why wouldn't that have been taken up with the review panel? Well, ultimately, um, the report uh, looked at a broader range of considerations than simply the impact uh, of um, the renewable energy target on electricity prices. Uh, you know, which is a which is an impact, but there are other impacts that the scheme has, and the report looked more broadly uh, at the impacts of the scheme than than its impacts on electricity prices. But the term of reference said specifically the review should provide advice on the extent of the RET's impact on electricity prices, 
and the range of options in relation to reducing them, and yet it didn't. Uh, in terms of the Secretariat, did you try and point out or inform the panel that the recommendations that were making were the two in the reverse of what they're asked to do? Well, I think the, uh, the panel was well, well aware of uh, the recommendations it was making. And it, as I've explained, they were framed against a broader range of considerations uh, in terms of the, uh, the costs and benefits of the scheme. So did the Secretariat draft uh, a report for the, uh, the, the uh, review members to sign off on? The, the Secretariat did prepare uh, draft material for the report uh, under the guidance of the panel. And so when you drew up your draft report for them to consider, did you in fact point out the, uh, that the cheaper options, um, raising to 30 per cent or keeping the existing scheme, would actually drive down prices more than the two that they, that they recommended? Well, Senator, I don't think we made a point of, of, of drawing that to the, the panel members' attention, but I mean, all the information about the various options was there for them to see uh, in the modelling analysis uh, and in the draft material for the report. So what we had was actually the options that were put forward uh, to the government from the review panel were the ones that would result in the most pollution, the least amount of investment and jobs, the highest electricity costs and a position that was opposed by 99.5 per cent of the submissions? Well, Senator, the, the, the recommendations and the analysis behind them uh, are spelt out in the report. Uh, so I don't, I don't know that I can do more than direct you to the report for the analysis and the recommendations. Oh, I've seen that, but I'm interested in the Secretariat's role in drawing up uh, the analysis. Can you tell me uh, did the Secretariat um, inform the, uh, the uh, review, the panellists, um, as to who would most benefit if their recommendations were adopted? Well, once again, Senator, the, the panel members uh, had access to and did consider uh, all of the information that was put forward to them uh, by, uh, sorry, from the modelling uh, and through stakeholder submissions. So uh, that, all that information was available to them. Uh, again, I don't think it was a case of the Secretariat pointing out any particular impacts uh, or, or issues. So is it true that um, page 48 of the ASIL report says, the shift to the lower mandated LRET improves coal-fired generators' values by around 9.3 billion in present value terms? 6.6 .6 billion for black coal, 2.7 billion for brown coal. Is that what the report actually says? Well, I, I could pull the report out and, and, and check that precise reference, but otherwise I'm, I'm willing to take your word for it, Senator. Okay, so on that basis, here we've got the people who would most benefit if the higher electricity costs uh, were adopted um, the recommendations that will provide the highest electricity costs were adopted. The people who would benefit are the coal-fired generators. I guess the, the two, two brief observations I'll make, Senator, are that um, the, the outcomes for electricity prices in the report reflect a, a certain set of assumptions. Uh, and and you know, there was sensitivity analysis uh, done around those assumptions, which did show that different outcomes were possible uh, uh, in terms of the impacts of the RET scheme on electricity prices. Uh, and I guess the other point I'd note is that um, you know, the fact that uh, a certain sector of the economy benefits uh, substantially from uh, you know, potentially winding back the scheme, I think, simply reflects the fact that of the effect that the scheme has when you introduce it uh, on that sector. Yeah, so what we've got is the beneficiaries of cutting back the RET are the coal generators and the losers of the community who will pay higher electricity prices? Well, again, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, Senator, the, the panel looked at a broader range of considerations uh, in terms of the impact of the scheme uh, throughout the economy than just its impact on uh, electricity prices. Even though the terms of reference required them specifically to address that? Well, I think the report does address the impacts of the scheme on electricity prices. Uh, but they were asked to look at the costs and benefits of the scheme 
uh, not just uh, specifically in relation to electricity prices. But uh, in terms of uh, the role of the Secretariat, who, who developed the assumptions that went into the modelling exercise? Well, ultimately, uh, the assumptions were agreed by the, the panel uh, and they were developed, uh, I guess, well, not I guess, but they were developed uh, through uh, discussions between the modelling consultants, the Secretariat and the panel. Okay, so the modelling consultants and the panel, what input did the Secretariat have to the assumptions? Uh, well, the Secretariat uh, does have uh, some expertise, of course, in uh, electricity market issues, uh, and so um, did uh, review uh, the assumptions. Um, I guess, maybe if I take a step back, Senator, uh, for most of the major assumptions used in the review, the panel took the decision to draw on uh, uh, projections uh, that were released uh, through uh, official uh, agencies or entities. So for example, the electricity demand projections uh, or assumptions uh, were literally taken from uh, estimates that had been released by the Australian Energy Market Operator uh, and by the West Australian Independent Market Operator uh, and uh, estimates about uh, technology costs were taken from uh, Breeze, uh, Australia's uh, Energy Technology Assessment. So um, very much it was the case that the, the panel made a decision about the approach it would take with the assumptions. Uh, and, and that decision was to, rather than develop their own assumptions, but draw on uh, uh, assumptions that reflected projections or estimates that had been prepared by uh, authoritative entities, um, uh, such as the entities that I've mentioned. And did uh, any of the panellists uh, change those assumptions? Uh, no. They just took them as they were? So uh, there were some... Uh, minor technical amendments made uh, to ensure that the uh, assumptions, in, in a sense, fit into the, the model uh, and, and aligned with the concepts that were being used at the model. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, repeat the details of those here, uh, but they, they were very minor uh, adjustments. Okay.